Hello and welcome. I'm Gaurav, data analyst at Eckhart Guild. This is the first in the series of statistical tutorials starting with the basics of statistics, namely descriptive statistics. But before we proceed further, let us have a look into the topics which I'll be covering in the subsequent lecture series. The first being descriptive statistics, the random variables, hypothesis testing, type 1 and type 2 errors, confidence intervals, and finally we'll end up with the ANOVA test. Now what does descriptive statistics deal with? Let us have a look. Descriptive statistics basically deals with four major areas. The first being measures of frequency, two, measures of central tendency, third being of dispersion, and finally fourth, the measures of position. Now what is their purpose? Descriptive statistics establishes a pattern in the data set, which is essential to find out the characteristics of our observations. If you are to speak in biological terms, these parameters comprise of the gene of any data set, such as complex problems like electoral vote calculations, to simplest problems like predicting the number of runs scored in a cricket match. Today we'll be covering the first two topics, namely measures of frequency and central tendency. Measures of frequency basically involves the creation of the frequency table, where we calculate the frequency and the cumulative frequencies with respect to each data value. Now what does frequency mean? Frequency is the number of times a data value occurs, and cumulative frequency is the sum of all previous frequencies up to that point. The following example depicts the marks scored by 20 students in an exam. Now what are the steps involved? At first we sort the data values in ascending order denoted by xi. The second step involves a tally count of each data value in the data set. The tally count itself gives us the frequency. Thirdly, the cumulative frequency is again calculated from the previous frequency column. Now let's have a look into the first row. The cumulative frequency for the first row is the frequency itself. The cumulative frequency for the second row is equal to the summation of cumulative frequency of the first row and the frequency of the second row. Henceforth, we arrive at the cumulative frequency for the last row, which is nothing but the total number of observations or total number of students, which validates our prior definition. Now let us have a hands-on experience in R where we'll be solving the problem statements mentioned in the slides. So the first problem involves ungrouped data. So first let us assign a vector to the variable name marks which contains all the 20 scores made by the students. So here if we run the statement, we'll see the values has been assigned to the variable marks. Now to, in order to create the frequency table, we first need to sort the data by using the sort function and passing the argument marks into it. Now as we run the program, we'll see the marks data values or marks have been assigned in ascending order. In order to calculate the frequency of each data value, we use the function named table. So if you run the statement, we'll see that each data value, the corresponding frequency has been calculated, right? Further on, to understand what each type of data value is present in the data set, we can use the function called factor. Now if you run the statement, we'll see variable name levels, which indicates the type of data in the data set. So 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, these are the type of data which are available in the data set with its own, having their own frequency. Now to have a more pictorial idea of the frequency distribution, we can use the function called hist to represent the histogram. If you run the hist function, on the right hand side of your screen, you can see the frequency distribution graph or the histogram graph. Here we can see the frequency with each data value has been calculated. Now the frequency table also requires the calculation of the cumulative frequency. For this, we use the cumsum statement or a cumsum function. Now we, we have, it is important to notice here that the cumsum function operates on the frequency which has been calculated through the table function. So if you run the statement, we can see that the third row contains all the cumulative frequencies of each data value. Now the question is, what do we do in case of large data spread, where the range of observations is very high? In such a case, the concept of class intervals come in. Here we have a data set showing the number of calls made by motorists per day. As you can see friends, the range is high. Hence we group the data or set up intervals where each group is generally termed as a class. Now what is the size of each class? In class intervals, the class starts with a data value which is a multiple of the class width. First, we calculate the difference between the highest and the minimum data value and divide it with a number 
in such a way the total number of rows in the column on a, or in the table comes to between 5 or 10. Here 40 is that number which is the class width. Further the frequencies and the cumulative frequencies are calculated just like before. Here it is also important to note that once the grouping is done data no longer remains discrete it has become continuous. Now let us execute the same problem statement in R. First we store the data values in the problem statement in the factor named calls. Now to find out the minimum and the maximum values of the data set we use the function called range. If we run the statement it indeed gives us the minimum and the maximum data value. Right? Looking at this we already mentioned in the slide that what the lowest limit of the class interval should be and that should be 0. So I have assigned it to the variable called low underscore val. If we run it, if we run it again, it is exhibited that 0 has been assigned to the low underscore val statement. Similarly, it goes for 240 as the highest limit of the class interval, keeping the step size same which is 40. Now the lower limit of each class has to be assigned which will be in a multiples of 40. For this, we use the sequence function. The sequence function has three arguments involved. First being the lowest limit of the class interval, second being the highest limit of the class interval and the step size which is 40. Now if we run this statement, we can see the lower limits of each class interval has been calculated. Right? Now the cut function is used to close the intervals thereby assigning the upper limits of the class. Here I have passed the calls vector and the limits into the cut function. When I use the right equal to false statement, it means the upper limits in each class will have open brackets indicating open interval. Now let's see. We can understand that each of the data values have open intervals at the end. right? Now I have used i to store this information. When I run the code, we find that the i factor contains the elements which are class intervals representing the original values. As you can see, each data value now is a class interval which represents the original data set or the original data value in the data set. If we move on further, the last column or the last row will have a value which lies between 80 and 120. Finally, using the table function, we calculate the frequency. The matrix is then stored in a data frame in DF. Now DF is modified by adding the columns of the cumulative frequency. As we run DF now, it gives us the tabulated features or tabulated calculations of the class intervals, the frequencies and the associated cumulative frequencies of each. Now let us come to the second part of our session. Measures of central tendency basically involve the calculations of the mean, median and the mode. Now what does these parameters indicate? It represents the average of the data set and the most frequently occurring data value. Mean is basically the arithmetic mean given by the formula summation of fi xi by n. Here frequency plays an important role. Since the data value 7 is our most occurring value, our mean value 6.85 lies in its vicinity. Thus the frequency might give us a fair idea of what the mean of the data set should be. The statistical median is the middle number in a sequence of data numbers. The first step lies in sorting of the data and locating the mid value. In case of even numbers, will arrive at two data points as the mid values. In this case, we further calculate the AM of these values. Here, in this case, total observation is 7. That is why our median lies in the fourth value, which is also 7. Mode is that data value which occurs with the maximum frequency. Here clearly, mode is also 7, because the frequency found out with respect to 7 is 5, which is maximum. Now, it is important to note here that mean and median and mode might share the same value because the distribution of data is such. It is important to note that the mean, median and mode are different parameters with their own unique dependencies. But in most real cases, mean, median and mode might not be equal. The next example will give us a deeper insight about this statement. Now I'm sure one question would be crossing your mind. How do we calculate the above parameters for a group data? This following slide will help us understand. Since the data is now grouped, we do not know the exact value, so we calculate the mid value of each group. Here, xi takes these values, and then the total mean is calculated just like before, which comes out to around 110. However, for median and mode, we need to first locate the median class and the modal class respectively. 
Now in the table, I have marked the required parameters in red so that we have an idea which values are required for median and mode calculations. As you can see, the median class falls in the nth by 2 frequency class which is here is the third class. The standard formula for calculating medium is given as follows, where L1 is the lower limit of the median class and FCP is the cumulative frequency of the previous class which is 8. After doing the calculations, median is estimated to be around 107. To find the modal class, we use a formula as given in the slide where F1 is the frequency of the modal class and F0 is the frequency of the previous class. Using the calculations, the mode is found out to be 103. From the table, the modal class is found out to be the third class, which holds the maximum frequency, which is 14. For mode calculations, the formula is given as follows, where F1 holds the frequency of the modal class, F0 is the frequency of the previous class, indicated in red in the table, and the F2 is the frequency of the next class. Now let us have a hands-on experience in R for the following problem statement. Now here we have the marks data which we already had. Now the mean and median functions in R help us calculate the mean and median directly by passing the factor marks into it. If we run the statement, here we see the mean has been calculated and the median has also been calculated. But R does not have any inbuilt function for mode. So we cr can create a function named get mode. The unique command which is available here returns a vector but with duplicate elements removed identifying the levels of xi. The 20th line in the code calculates the mode by using the match function to address the that data value which has the maximum frequency by utilizing the which.max function. Now if we run this code now at a stretch. So the get mode function has been created right now. So now as we pass on the vector marks into the get mode function we will get the result. The result being 7 which is the same result which we found out in the slides. Now here we can also use the names function to access the levels because we can calculate the mode without creating a function as well. Now here I have used the names function to access the levels in the table marks data and to find out the data value which is associated with the maximum frequency. If we run this statement, we will directly get, if we type here mode, we will directly get the answer which is 7. Now this is a much simpler approach but creating a function always helps in increasing our work speed especially in iterative cases. Now let us execute the central tendencies for the group data in R. Now here I have used a sequence function to put in the parameters the lowest value, the step value and the high value. Right? So after running this statement, we will get to understand that the i underscore mid variable records all the mid values of the respective class intervals. And that is henceforth we find out the frequency of, or the mean of the table. Now, such a hands-on calculations might be very tedious. So we also can use the summary function to find out all the characteristics which are looking for from the data set. So here we can see that the minimum and maximum as well as the mean and the median can be calculated. Now in the slide we inferred that the mean was found out to be greater than the median which in turn was greater than the mode. Now to substantiate this we can plot the histogram of the data by using the hist function. When you plot it, we can clearly see that the histogram is right skewed or positively skewed, which substantiates our prior assumption. In this case, like many other real case scenarios, we often come across data sets where the mean, median and the mode are different. But why? Because the median is associated with the middle value of the data set, whereas the mode is more inclined towards the maximum frequency. And it makes sense, cause mode of frequency, higher the weightage. In this case, it is interesting to note that mean is greater than median, which was found out to be greater than mode. Such a situation states that the data is rightly skewed or positively skewed. This sums up the topics for today. We will cover the next topics of measures of variation and location in the upcoming video lecture. Thank you for watching the video. For more such videos, please subscribe to our channel. A cat killed. Average is dead.